We're in the City Arts Centre in Edinburgh, and it's a great collection of Scottish art, from historic up to contemporary. And I wanted to have an exhibition here of uh, some of my pictures and make uh, juxtapositions because there are things uh, between pictures which are visual, which connect pictures from all periods, historic, modernist, postmodernist, abstract, figurative, lumpy and flat, all of those things, which people don't expect because people tend to put things in different drawers in their head. So this picture is I can't even remember what I titled this picture, Headbangers, I think, because this man is uh, in his mobility scooter in Bethnal Green in London, where I live. And he drives his mobility scooter on the street. And he has a very big hat and these headbanger things in the mirror because he wants to make himself very visible in case he gets run over. Over to this picture, they've both got hats, they're both loudly dressed. This is called Show Jamie, it's painted in 1842 and was gifted to this gallery 100 years ago. And Show Jamie was a local character, an eccentric, um, who was actually murdered for his body and had a sad end. They disfigured the face of the uh, victim in order that he wouldn't be recognized. So he was a victim of the famous Edinburgh body snatchers, Birkenhead. That's something I didn't know about, but uh, pictures do come with baggage. So my picture seems relatively innocent, this local eccentric, because there's always somebody who's a bit weird in any community, someone who's off piste. And so these are not only juxtaposed for the factual reason, but uh, I think that visually they work rather well together with the reds and the greens and the hats. So I've always looked to be educated by basically a shop, a private gallery. And this place has always surprised me because I know nothing about Scottish art. This, this shows your knowledge, this exhibition doesn't it? In the, in well, I'm choice. a bit older now because I'm yes. 70. But when I first started coming here, and I wouldn't come to Edinburgh without visiting this gallery, uh, because I would always come away with some new knowledge. So it was very exciting when Maeve Toll, who's the curator here, um, co-joined with me to make this exhibition and accepted the idea because the, the template for the exhibition, the idea of juxtaposing things, came from two other exhibitions the first of which was at the Whitechapel Gallery back in the 90s, which was curated by the artist Michael Craig Martin, who had an exhibition of drawings called Drawing the Line. And he'd chosen every kind of drawing from, you know, an erased de Kooning drawing to, you know, uh, an old master drawing. I don't know how he remembers that, the, the erased uh, de Kooning drawing. Yes. He, had, he had gone across, it was pan the world. Yes. And that was a really wonderful exhibition and very influential. I thought it was extremely clever of him. Mm. And then more recently, I can't remember his date, it was an, uh, an exhibition at the, at the um, was at the, it was actually at the Tate, what's now called Tate Britain. I think it was possibly just before Tate Modern opened. It was called Turner and the Masters. And Turner being a pugnacious cockney, uh, had squared up to Van Dyck, to Rembrandt, to Titian, mm. and even John Martin, there was one uh, juxtaposition, I think. Um, so there was this sort of um, juxtaposition with Turner, you know, so there might be a Turner seascape and there might be a Dutch Van der Waals or something like that. You, you, you know, there would be this kind of juxtaposition, and that influenced me as well. The, in the run-up to this, and I thought I'd mm. love to do that. When I was fishing around looking for connections and pictures that might work with some of my stuff, I came across this beautiful picture by Henry John Lintock, painted 
and I think 1915, and this is a dead soldier being spirited away by angels. But when I saw the picture, I saw it in a book, and it's a very small reproduction, and I thought it was three levitating women, a bit like the witches in the Goya. And I had got this picture of a suburban housewife on a trampoline. So I thought, well, they're levitating. And when I heard the story of this painting, when I actually saw it, it was much bigger than I thought it was going to be, I felt shamed by the gravity of the image. But then I thought, well, why not confess up, you know, and say, well, this is, if you look at things purely visually, you, you, you consider them in that way. And basically it is about flight and the human... Um, you, you know, desire to fly and all the religious iconography that's about transportation and all the rest of it. Um, so I thought that would be fun to make this juxtaposition of something which is much more uh, banal. So things like the palette and tonality <clears throat> and perspective and um, <clears throat> blue, different blues and yeah. how to mix and how to apply, how to... Yeah apply ground. I mean, your, your work is full of skills yes. of that kind, which presumably you were taught. Uh, actually, no. no. <clears throat> I wasn't taught anything at art school. I no. just, it was just, uh, going to art school was basically about going to the student union bar every night and getting pissed, mm. and going to discos, yes. in fact. What, um, I think that if you were taught anything, it was more of an intellectual discourse. Seriously. Hmm. Because I went to Chelsea Art School and <clears throat> uh, you had a space and you chalked your name up in the space and after about three weeks a man came up to me, it was an American man, <clears throat> and said, hi, I'm your tutor. I said, oh, right. And I sort of waited for him to, and he said, yeah, my name's Ryan, I'm your tutor and, uh, you know, when you do something, you'll talk. And he walked off. He became one of my best friends, you know. Yes. Uh, uh, and I was influenced by him deeply. But uh, that was the attitude that... Uh, and then another uh, one of my tutors was Anne rees Jacob rees aunt, who was a film tutor. And she it was one of those tutors who gets to know the students really well and invites them for dinner and that kind of thing. She became one of my best friends in, you know, in, in those days. And uh, she said to me something interesting. She said that Chelsea Art School was very good in some ways and very bad in other ways because people who, the ethos was that if people had something they could do, they would flourish. But people who needed, you know, help to be brought, yes, yeah. would fail. I'm more interested to know why, whether you'd realise why I've put these two paintings together, Johnny. Okay, so there's a large John McFadden canvas. And this is, is it Donald Proven? It's Donald Proven, yeah. Initially, it was drawn to the horizon line and the way that my eye is drawn. That's a good try. But mm. it's wrong. It's wrong. And I then noticed that there was a dog here in the foreground, or at least in the base, the base of the canvas, left-hand side and then the right-hand side of Jock's painting. Am I correct in that? Um, You've got it. The thing about the Proben is normally I make pictures like this uh, urban landscape. That's my thing. That's what I like. And occasionally I make pictures which are bereft of anything. This is Carlusti Beach. The juxtaposition is the fact that they're very different, but they're connected by the dog who could have walked from this painting into Glasgow. Previous painting, when you talked about it being a more graphic image, you were portraying the man with the balloons and the, uh, the, the mobility scooter, and the features of his face as a more sense of detail. But with this painting, we have large, broad, as well as broad gestures, if you like, as well as this very fine Descriptive painting as well. Yeah, but you're a musician. I mean, that's counterpoint, isn't it? You 
have um, the string section and the wind and everything, and you look at the triangle. The difficulty with painting like that, of course, is to keep it all in the same key, because if the paint gets fussy and painted differently, you've lost. The most exciting thing about um, art school for me was being in an art school, being an art student in Chelsea in the 1970s, because the art school was in the King's Road, and Mick Jagger and Keith Richards lived nearby, and the Mamas and Papas, and Ken Russell would be driving about in his Jaguar, and that kind of thing. So there was a real vibe. And then in about 1975, the Pistols came and started sort of hanging around the pubs in Chelsea. And there was the clash and the jam and the whole punk thing sort of took place in that part of London. So it was end to end a very exciting place to be a young person. Probably the art school was about the dullest place um, in the whole of that neighborhood in SW3. Um, you know, I could, we could have anecdotes for a long time about that. But um, the influences uh, I had did come from the abstract painters, people like Ian Stevenson and John Hoyle and, and Richard Smith, and even people like Robin Denny, who were the few painters in the 1960s who managed to cut some sort of profile alongside pop art. The most exciting thing that happened to me in the 1970s was I'd had a year at Chelsea Art School, um, which was thrilling and exciting, and, you know, uh, all that. And then in the uh, holidays, I became quite rich because I could sign on the door because I had a child, I had a little boy and uh, my wife, and we lived in a squat in Chelsea. And um, my little boy used to play with Christine Keeler's little boy who lived also along the road, not in a squat. Um, so those were the times. Margaret Thatcher lived around the corner in Flood Street. She was the only leader of the opposition in those days. In fact, maybe she wasn't yet in 1974. In 1974, I went to join a kind of collective in Covent Garden called Artist Meeting Place. And one of the other people I remember went to the meetings there was Genesis P. Orridge, who later became famous through Throbbing Gristle. Anyway, the thing about this collective was uh, that you could get an exhibition if you just put your name down and you agreed to invigilate it. Mm. And this man said, well, I'm quite interested in this artist, Jock McFadden. So I sort of immediately stood to attention. And he, he bought a painting from me for £100, which in 1974 was real money. You know, you could buy a car for £100. Not a new one, but, you mm. know, quite a good one. And as he left, this man, who was in his late 30s, he said, oh, by the way, I, I'm a painter too. I'm Alan Jones. And I thought, fuck me, Alan Jones? Because I'd swatted up on him um, well, for my interview at Chelsea Art School, uh, post-war British art, you know, and pop art, and David Hockney, and Peter Blake, and all of those people. So um, that was very thrilling. And when I went back to the art school after the summer holidays, um, and I said, oh, I sold the painting to Alan Jones, nobody believed me. We're looking for threads of connection between disparate works. Although Barnes Graham, as you pointed out, was a Scottish artist working in England. Uh, same here. But none of that bothers me. What? interests me is uh, this shape here, uh, making a connection with that shape, the colour. These marks are a bit like graffiti, these abstract um, gestures. And this bottom half of this picture is actually a real part of a real graffitied wall, which I've stuck on some wallpaper. So. I guess the colours that are picked up are just fortuitous and lucky. And 
it's with that spirit that the rest of the juxtapositions have been made. I think all painting's abstract. I mean, uh, it, even if it's a photorealist painting, you go that close up to it. I remember when my uh, grandfather, uh, who worked in the shipyards, used to, uh, you know, give me lunch on Saturdays sometimes. He took me to Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And he showed me the great Salvador Dali painting, St. John of the Cross, looking down on the head of Christ, his red drapes. And the other thing he made me do, he pointed out post-impressionist paintings. And he said, said, if you go close up to them, you can't see what it is. If you stand back, back, it all comes into focus. So uh, that is, there's something or in that, which uh, I've always remembered, that uh, pictures are shapes and colours, really, that's all. And texture. Can you say something about the, the human presence in your paintings? You mean the absence the subject, of the The subjects that you choose to paint, <coughs> in a sense. This question about the subject, I think, is interesting. It's difficult, though, Johnny, because <coughs> Everybody says that to me. Some people say the buildings are the people. Yeah. I don't see any of them. Yeah. It's something other people see. But that, that is um, probably the right way around. Because if I saw it, <coughs> I would probably start to address it. And then it would not possibly work. And I think there must be something in it. Because everybody says that. They say, oh, there's, the, there's a presence there. And I don't get it at all. I just yeah. think I'm doing a place. And then, but I, 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 tr I do believe what you're saying. I think people see this, and um, I don't. I think <laughs> people often ask, you know, why do you, what do you paint? Why do you paint such subjects? And yeah. it's, it's kind of, why would, you, why would you answer that question? It's like, uh, it probably goes back to your student days or even before your student days when, you, when, you're, when you're becoming a young artist. And I wondered if you, you have a large a studio in London where you pay, much of this work has been painted yeah. in London. Yeah, you, all of yeah, it. All yeah. in London, yes. All of it. And in a way that's from memory and from studies and from, it's a life's work in a sense. No studies, no. No studies. No. No sketchbooks. No, 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 sketch no. no ever draw. Yeah. It's a terrible thing to say. So when it? I refer to the drawing in your paintings, the yes. sort of structure and the, yes. the way that you compose the paintings, it's, yes. it's all in the painting. It's all in the painting. There's no drawing. There's no preparation. Because in a you way, know. the teaching situation is when you're almost offering advice to a student. Like, you could try this, or why don't you... Uh, That's the trouble with teaching. You know? I didn't have any advice to give. And I was just a terrible teacher, uh, and I used to go to the Slade every Thursday. And um, I think the trouble with teaching in art schools is that it's an impossible thing, because if the student is any good, you don't really want some bloke coming up and talking to them about their work. They're too busy and involved in it. Yes. And if, although influence is something which is important, and you, you know, the, the Germanic way of having the studio system where you work under a master, mm. <coughs> not a very fashionable word these days, <coughs> then <coughs> you would have, you know, for example, Kiefer studied under Boyce. Well, look at the color scheme of Kiefer. Beige, mm. waxy, mm. sticking things on. You can see what he's taken from Boyce, in my opinion, rust. So you worked under the master, do you mean? And that, yeah. that was the yeah. studio system. You would go to um, uh, an art school, and each studio would have a master. You can't call them mistresses. I'm sure some of the masters would have been women. Mm. And <coughs> you would go to the first room, and if that master didn't want you, you would go to the next room. And if he didn't want you, you would go to the next room. And she didn't mm. want you, let's say. Uh, and then if no, none of them accepted you, you, would have, you, you hadn't got in. And that's how that worked. So we have Ghost on my right here, your painting, or Ghost. Mm -hmm. And this is a Kirkwood, mm -hmm. I believe. And if you could say something about this particular juxtaposition. 
Well, I saw this John Kirkwood picture in the store, and uh, I was drawn to it probably because of my sort of past in the west of Scotland, industry, shipbuilding, boiler making, uh, grunge, <laughs> rain, wind, steam and speed. I don't know. It just seems to be uh, very much resonant of the detritus of, you know, the fag end of the Industrial Revolution. And the underground stations in London, which this ghost, my painting, quite often they're very, very distressed and unmodern and decrepit. And of course, they've got a sort of dark associations of, you know, unknown tunnels, disused tunnels, occasional bodies. Um, someone throws themselves in front of a tube train, I think twice a week in London, something like that. And the driver gets a day off if they hit someone. So these are the associations. Uh, so dark in terms of atmosphere. But I just thought it was such a fabulous offering for uh, a visual connection. And there are moments of red here, as in some cabling along the bottom of the picture, and also a wee bit of a reflected light there. So I just think these paintings uh, are great friends, really. But I didn't actually paint any of my pictures in response to any of the pictures in the show. So all of these juxtapositions are complete coincidences, which makes it much more exciting, I think. So John McFadden goes to the pictures and yes. he brings, he brings pictures yeah. from his well, studio. Well, the pictures represent yeah. me. You know. And they come together with these examples and they're, yeah. they're very considered um, placed side by side in very interesting ways. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank yeah. you very much for your well, comments. Thank you, John. Yes. It's always a pleasure. Okay.